Hello and welcome to Football League World TV. This is the EFL Midweek Review Show. We're going to be touching on some of the bigger games from over the last few days. Uh, we can't talk about every single game because we haven't got the time, but we're going to be talking about some of the more interesting fixtures uh, that played out. Uh, my name is Sam Rock and I'm joined by my colleagues Chris Forp and George Harvey this morning. Chris, how are you getting on this morning? Yeah, very good, mate. Still buzzing off the, the win at Lincoln on Tuesday, which we'll come on to later. So, yeah. I'm very well. Good stuff. And uh, George, how you getting on? Yeah, marvellous. Yeah, weather's lovely in the best city in England. So, yeah, can't complain, mate. Brilliant stuff. Uh, so, we're going to kick off with the Championship first up. Uh, just before we begin, if you're watching this show on YouTube, Facebook or Twitter, please do get your comments in. Were you at an EFL game over the last two days? Let us know how your team got on. Uh, and we'll get it up uh, during this live show. But let's start off uh, with a really interesting game at Ashton Gate on Tuesday night. Bristol City took on Nottingham Forest. Um, Bristol City looking to break that hoodoo at, at Ashton Gate. Uh, it was 16 games without a win uh, up until that point. Uh, and uh, that hoodoo did continue, didn't it? They uh, lost 2-1 in uh, quite dramatic fashion. Alex Scott putting Bristol City 1-0 up in the first half. But a late brace from Lyle Taylor in the last two minutes of added time secured a real dramatic win for Steve Cooper and his side. Cooper's unbeaten start to life at the Reds continues. Uh, George, we'll come to you. I suppose around the 90th minute mark, I suppose a lot of Reds fans would have been consigned to, to, to no points, coming away with no points. But uh, it was some turnaround, wasn't it? Yeah, remarkable. Yeah, yeah. Um... I think they were they were lucky. Uh, I mean, they improved a lot in the second half, but I think Bree Summer pulled off a couple of great saves to keep uh, City at bay and keep the scores down, which obviously proved to be influential in the end. But um, I mean, I'm too far. I one nil down. You've always got a chance away from home when you you put men forward. You look at the three subs you made: Martin, Lolly, and Taylor, all attack-minded subs, fresh legs, and mm. you know, just you don't see stuff like it normally. I mean, it's just a remarkable turnaround, like you said. They, Won a, a penalty late on. Taylor scored, and normally you'd expect them to run straight into the away end and take the point on the road and you know take your medicine. But it says a lot about the way Forest have transformed under Cooper that they went straight into the goal, got the ball up, went back to centre circle, and Bristol City just lost all composure. Long kick forward, Forest scored the next counter attack, and you know it, it's just a fantastic turnaround. And you know credit to Lyle Taylor as well, fourteen minutes on the pitch and to score two goals in in quite. Remarkable fashion. I mean, one was a penalty and one was from a yard out, but you've got to be in the right place at the right time. Um, so, no, another another win and, and the Reds train keeps uh, marching on. Yeah, absolutely. Forrest up to 14th position right now. Four wins in a row uh, for Steve Cooper. I mean, George, just, just what do you put it down to, this kind of turn up in form? Because it, it seems to be a complete contrast to what it was under Chris Hewton. Yeah, um, I mean, Cooper and Hewton, I've said it before, are very different characters. Cooper's obviously a more modern, progressive uh, tap minded thinking coach. I mean, um, I saw a stat um, before I came on here. Forest have scored two goals or more in five of the last six league games. Mm. They only managed that once in the previous 26 before, um, obviously, these last uh, six games. So it's just the shackles have been lifted. And I think the change of system as well to put Spence and Low at wing backs has just been influential. Um, they're playing with clearly so much belief. I mean, at 91st minute when you equalise at Ashton Gate they've still got belief that they can score goals with, with two minutes to play uh, and go and win the game. So, um, no, uh, the, the attacking players, the shackles being lifted and, uh, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a great team to watch at the moment. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Chris, as for, as for Bristol City, I mean, how gut-wrenching is this? You know, it's so close to your first home win in, in 16 games and, and, and Lyle Taylor does that to you. I mean, how, how must you be feeling as a Bristol City fan right now? Oh, you feel absolutely gutted, to be honest. Um, yeah, they just, they just can't do it at home. Um, you know, the only sort of example I can think of that was similar was Sunderland when they, they couldn't win at the Stadium of Light for ages. Um, but but for me, Bristol City haven't been the same sort of club since uh, Lee Johnson left, really. They haven't really had a stable manager since then. They obviously lost a lot of that squad that got them on that run to the, uh, the League Cup semi-final. Um, so yeah, it's a really strange time for him, and and I just don't think Nigel Pearson sort of um, hit the heights that that many might have thought that he would have done by now. Um, so yeah, it's massive kick in the teeth for for Robins fans for sure, mate. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, Robins did have chances in that game to to extend mm. that lead. Uh, that Naki Wells chance 
in particular mm. standing out where he was through on goal. But Bryce, yeah. Bryce Samba pulling out a, a really impressive save. Um, it, you know, it, it, it's a tough one for Bristol City here. I mean, what do you think they need to do, Chris, to, to rejuvenate their fortunes? Because it seems to me that, that Pearson has been kind of trying to tweak that formation. He's been bringing different players in, trying to kind of find that consistent 11. But he just doesn't seem to have found it, has he, right now? Yeah, I think you don't want to tinker with it too much. Um, I think the the key to building the winning team is, is keeping a consistent start on 11. Uh, obviously, you know, injuries permitting, you know, you're always going to get injuries no matter what team you have. Um, but yeah, keeping a, a consistent start on 11 uh, and obviously feeding those chances to the likes of Wells and, and Wyman as well, because obviously they're the two key players who are who are going to get them up the league. Um, so yeah, no, I'd say less changes and, and more consistently personally. Consistency, sorry, personally. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Bristol City have a very impressive away record this season, but uh, definitely, of course, need to sort out that form at Ashton Gate. Right, let's touch on another championship game next. Uh, let's move up to Yorkshire. Sheffield United took on Millwall on Tuesday night. Alfie Burns, uh, Football League reporter, was there at Bramall Lane uh, in the evening. It was quite an interesting game as well. Uh, Millwall came away with the three points. A last-minute Jake Cooper stunner uh, to win it for the Lions. Um, Jed Wallace put Millwall 1-0 up after uh, a very... Uh, was, it, was, it, was it... Did he mean it or not? Did he mean it or not? Um, it was a, a cross-turn shot that evaded Robin Olsen. Uh, Billy Sharp equalised for the Blades. And as I already mentioned, Jake Cooper secured the win uh, for the Lions, uh, it's been three defeats in the Blades' last four games now. Uh, a bit of a, a, a bit of a wobble, it's fair to say, for Savisa Janikovic and his side. Uh, George, come to you first. Uh, the Blades will be disappointed with this one, won't they? Yeah, definitely. Um, you know, they, they've produced some uh, some decent performances at home of late. Obviously, came from behind to uh, to beat Stoke at the weekend. So I think a lot of fans were going into the last night's game or Tuesday night's game. Sorry. Um, full of confidence and full of optimism, really. It, it's, it appears to me that he's still trying to find his best 11, um, which is a bit of a worry after 13 games. You know, I mean, I was looking at um, the, the 6-2 win against Peterborough they recorded not so long ago, a few weeks ago. If that, there was six changes um, from that team compared to Tuesday night's team, which, mm. you know, suggests, you know, needs, needs to be a real sense of consistency at Bramwell Lane. Um, you know, Lee Smoose came on and played well the other night. Um uh, sorry, a little day against Stoke and think was the on new sub last night uh, on Tuesday night. So, um, you know, they've got a very good squad on paper there. If you look at the players they've got, and you know, some of them have even achieved success with Sheffield United at that uh, level before, but it just seems to me that the 4 3 one doesn't really suit them. Um, obviously, they played a lot of 3 5 2 under Chris Wilder, but um, it's a transition they're still getting used to. And as I said, I don't think he knows his best 11 after 13 games, which is a, it's, it's a concern. So, no, disappointing performance. Obviously, Gibbs White's going to be missing for a game now as well against Barnsley after uh, picking up a second yellow. So, he's been there, probably the most productive player of late. So, no, uh, tough times at the moment. And they'll hope to obviously get back to winning ways against um, a struggling Barnsley team this weekend. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, as for as for Millwall, Chris, uh, three wins now from their last four games. Uh, it's been a nice upturn in form from Gary Rowett's men after a series of what felt like tons of draws, really. But they've started to, to win games now. Um, just just how impressed were you with Millwall in this one, uh, in particular? You know, the, the character to to kind of continue going and and, and win the game in the last minute. It's, it's impressive, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, you know, South London rivalries aside, they have a lot of time for Millwall because of the, the way that they play and, and how competitive they are and, and how hard they are to beat, really. Um, I think Rowett's done a pretty good job considering how uh, highly regarded Neil Harris was. Obviously, it didn't go well for him towards the end of his tenure there, but Rowett's sort of gone in and, and sort of given them an extra edge and sort of moved them closer to those playoffs. Um, you know, they're always there or thereabouts. And they never quite get over the line, so maybe this season could be the season they do it. Obviously, Jeb Wallace is still the main man, um, but they, they always get goals from set pieces. And, you know, Cooper, not not usually uh, known for, for hitting strikes from long range, but but what a goal it was and fair play to him. Um, you know, if they can keep on getting goals from different areas of the team, then they could be right up there for the playoffs. You know, it's it's anyone's game right now. Um, it just depends if they can stay in it for the, for the long run. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, George, let's just touch on that Jed Wallace goal then. Uh, 11 minutes in, uh, Jed Wallace down the right flank. Uh, whips in a ball from about what 35 40 yards and it, it evades Robin Olsen. I mean, what do you think it was? Do you think he meant it or not? 
uh, if you meant it, they need some player. Um, but I suppose, I, I mean, it's, it's, uh, if he comes away from saying that's a goal, then I'm not sure. But um, I mean, when you're in form, you're in form. So when you when you look in, you look in. I think that's five goals and four assists now in 12 or 13 games. So, um, you know, it, it's going to be a worry for Millwall as well, because obviously he's out of contract in the summer as well. So they won't want to lose him for free at the end of the season. But you also won't want to, won't want to cash in uh, in January or lose him on a pre-contract deal. So it's going to be, it's going to be tough. He's a great player. who's obviously got pretty good technical ability, but I'm not sure Jed, you meant that one, mate. So um, sorry about that. <laughs> there we go. George Harvey has uh, spoken. Uh, right. Uh, let's move uh, to Stoke next. Uh, there was a really intriguing clash on Tuesday night at the Bet365 Stadium. Stoke took on uh, li- league leaders, AFC Bournemouth. Uh, Bournemouth, of course, have started the season in spectacular fashion, uh, remain unbeaten, and they recorded a 1 0 win uh, at Stoke uh, in the week. Uh, Dom Solanke scoring the solitary goal for Scott Parker's side as they continue to march on at the top of the league. Uh, the Cherries now find themselves six points clear of third place. Uh, right now in the Skybet Championship. Uh, it's It's been some start. Uh, George, Stoke, a tough place to go this season. Uh, Michael O'Neill's side have looked uh, a real force at times uh, during the start of this season. So this is some result, isn't it, for Bournemouth to come away with, firstly, a clean sheet, and, and secondly, three points. Yeah, um, probably a different type of win to what we associate with Bournemouth as well, obviously. Um you know, weren't at the best going forward, but they got the goal and it's remained uh, solid ever since. I think the sign of Gary Cable has been absolutely influential. Um, and as I said, Oak were a very good team to, uh, very hard team to beat down and, you know, very well drilled and organised, especially at home. Um, but they didn't seem to get into their usual rhythm. Um, I just think, you know, I think it's eight goals against this season now. Um, that's so impressive given how good they are going forward and how free flowing they are going forward as well. Um, I think when, when Parker took Fulham up, um, they scored a lot of goals, but they conceded, I think it was 48 as well, which is probably the worst out of the top 12. Um, so that probably suggests that he's learned a thing or two in his two years, um, you know, since then. So um, very, very good team to watch at the moment. Obviously, even without David Brooks, you know, they've got uh, some fantastic players. And then the son of Robbie Brady as well was very impressive as well. So, um, no, definitely expect them to be right up there coming into the season. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, two players we've spoken about a lot on Football League by TV this season and also on the website are Jaden Anthony and, and Jordan Zamora. They continue to impress down that left-hand flank. I just couldn't believe how far Jordan Zamora got forward in that particular game. Sometimes, you know, he's playing left-back, but the way he kind of is so adventurous in his play and more often than not, he'd be in the opposition box. It was it was unbelievable, but uh, he's had a great start to the season. Also, I just want to touch on uh, on Ryan Christie's performance as well. He's had a really solid start to life since joining from Celtic. Uh, Chris, how important do you think he'll be for, for Bournemouth this season? Because he started really well, hasn't he? Yeah, I think he's a really interesting signing when they brought him in. Um, I think, obviously, Burnley were said to be interested in him as well. And he's obviously chosen to go to the Championship as opposed to the Premier League. Um, he's definitely a Bournemouth-type player. Obviously, can play wide on the right but also as a number 10, as he did a lot for Celtic. So it'd be interesting to see where uh, Parker sees him long term. Obviously, um, you know, sadly, David Brooks isn't isn't going to be able to play for a little while. So there could be space for him to, to stay on that right hand side and cut in on his left foot. Um, but yeah, no, I think the versatility really helps him. And, and having that sort of player who can create from not only a wide position, but also, you know, the half spaces between the lines, it's really going to help them. And it's only going to help Solanke to, to thrive even more and score more goals. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, Stoke weren't necessarily completely outplayed in this game. Uh, Stoke had their fair share of chances, uh, hit the post as well. Uh, George, we'll just come to you. I mean, in terms of Stoke this season, are they a team you, you kind of env- envisage battling for the playoffs come, come May? Yeah, I mean, it's it's hard to, you know, it's, I mean, it's always easy to kind of just say, oh, they won't do anything now. Now they've lost two games on the bounce, but in them, two games have been, you know, very much in them. Obviously, they shouldn't have thrown away a 1-0 lead at Bramall Lane. Um, but that's also sometimes a tough place to go when the, when the fans get on you. Um, and obviously last night, they come up against probably the best team in the division at the moment. So I still envisage that they'll be right up there. I mean, um, you know, as I said, they've got some great players to this level. I think Mario Vrancic has been a fantastic signing. Rain Sawyers as well. Um, you know, very good, um, solid home record. And I think that's what will probably carry them through to the end of the season. But I think they've got a good manager as well. I think it's taken him a, a while now to... Um, you know, really get his squad in place after you know picking up the pieces after Nathan Jones left. Um, but no, very good manager, and I, yeah, I still think they're a, a formidable outfit. Um, and 
they weren't beat, they weren't battered on uh, Tuesday, uh, Wednesday night. So uh, they'll be there at the end of the season. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, just a reminder for, for anyone that's watching this live show, please do get in the live chat on YouTube. Uh, were you at an EFL game this week? We want to hear from you. Uh, right, let's touch on one more championship game next. Uh, let's touch on Reading Blackpool. Uh, I was there as a fan of Reading last night. Uh, incredibly happy at half time, not so much at full time. Uh, Royals went into a 2 0 lead in the first half. Scott Dan and Tom Deli Bashiru on the score sheet for the home side. But uh, a second half resurgence from Neil Critchley's Blackpool secured uh, a valuable three points. Uh, for the Tangerines. I've got to say, uh, they were fantastic throughout the whole night. George, you saw Blackpool uh, on Saturday, didn't you, against Forest, and uh, you were kind of impressed with them then. Uh, There's four wins now in, in Blackpool's last six, uh, six games, sorry. Uh, a really, really impressive run of recent form. Uh, Chris, I guess we'll come to you first, uh, kind of watching this game from the outside. Did you expect Blackpool to, to bring it back like they did? I think with them, um, you know, they've always got goals in them, but at the same time, they, they're always going to concede two or three. Uh, so they're never boring to watch. Um, and yeah, you know, with Reading, you've obviously given away a few leads already this season at home as well. So, it's, you know, maybe they went there with that in mind and, and thought, oh, you know, if we get at them, we can, you know, we can get a result. And, and obviously they did, even despite going 2 0 down. But I saw a similar thing. Um, when I when I watched Bournemouth versus Blackpool earlier this season, Bournemouth were tuning up and then Blackpool came storming back in the second half. So they got the players to do it. And I think most importantly for them is Jerry Yates has started scoring again just at the right time, especially with Lavery being out injured. Um, so, yeah, no, they've sort of kept the same style that they used um, to great effect in League One. And, um, yeah, they'll be hoping it continues in the Championship for sure. Yeah, absolutely. I don't know what Neil Critchley said at half time, but it, it certainly worked. Um, I was just so impressed with the way they kind of harried, harried Reading all night and uh, they're relentless in their press. Whenever they lost the ball, they were straight, straight there to kind of reclaim possession uh, and get the ball forward. Uh, just touching on Jerry Yates, he obviously scored uh, a brace last night for Blackpool. He's, he's starting to find his feet in the second tier. Obviously, Shane Lavery out. It's kind of gave him an opportunity uh, to be the main man up top. George, just how important do you think Jerry Yates will be for Blackpool this term? Very important, yeah. Um, as you said, great for him to start scoring goals. Um, you know, now after, after being so prolific last season in League One, uh, I think it was uh, very important that he started scoring. Particularly now, Lavery's obviously been out injured and obviously they uh, failed to get back Ellis Sims in the summer as well. And, and Tyrese John Jules has probably played more of a winger than a, than a striker. So, um, very good player. I think it was always going to take him a, a bit of time to you know adapt to adapt to Championship football. I've been only really cut it in League One and League Two before now, but um, you know he, he's in great form. I mean, um, obviously he scored penalty last night, but a very uh, good header um, left on Mark in the Reading defence, which I'm sure you won't be happy with, Sam. Um, but no, very good striker, can score many different types of goals. And I think uh, if he stays fit, he'll definitely be on double figures, if not pushing for that a 15 to 20 goal mark. Yeah, he, he was fantastic last night, it's got to be said. Uh, it's also worth a mention, uh, Owen Dale came on uh, midway through the second half, uh, scored a goal and provided an assist. Uh, this was his championship debut as well uh, for Blackpool and uh, he really, really impressed uh, down that flank, uh, really kind of uh, making stuff happen for the Tangerines. He's a player to certainly keep an eye on over the following weeks. Uh, but a massive win uh, for Blackpool. And I also want to commend the, the Tangerines army that, that came to the Select Carlisle Stadium. They packed out that away and made lots of noise on what was uh, a disgusting, uh, in terms of weather, it was uh, tipping it down all evening. But uh, but they came in in, in their numbers and, and really impressed. Right, that's, uh, that's the Championship done. We're going to touch on a few League One games next. As ever, please do send in your comments uh, on this live show. Were you at an EFL game over the last few days? We want to hear from you. Uh, but I guess there's only one place to start in League One. Uh, a, a massive result, a standout result in League One on Tuesday evening. Uh, Ipswich Town beating Portsmouth 4-0 at Fratton Park. A real statement result for Paul Cook's men. Obviously, Paul Cook coming up against his former side in this one. So it had that little bit of an edge to it. Uh, and obviously Connor Chaplin as well, playing for Ipswich, uh, uh, playing against his boyhood club Portsmouth and scoring as well. It was a, a real standout uh, win. Uh, Macaulay Bond, Chaplin, Sonia Luco 
and Wes Burns on the score sheet uh, for the Tractor Boys. Uh, Chris, let's come to you first. I certainly didn't expect a result like this, but uh, but it was it was it was something special, wasn't it, from Ipswich? Yeah, absolutely, and, and maybe it's been a a long time coming, if you if you could say, but not not through their uh, previous performances. Obviously, they've not lived up to expectations, but you know the quality's always been there in the squad. You know, there's some players in there that should be playing in the championship, to be quite honest. Um, and yeah, it's it's just crazy considering Portsmouth put four past Sunderland the other the other day. So for them to lose four 0 at home to, to Ipswich, it's very strange. Um, but yeah, no, everything just seemed to click, and and I think that's what Paul Cook's been been looking for ever since he assembled this sort of star-studded squad, if you like. So hopefully this can be a um, a sort of um, platform for them to now go on a run of wins, which which they obviously haven't done so far. And um, yeah, they're starting to to move up the table after you know occupying the relegation places, surprisingly. So yeah, a lot of Tractor Boys fans will be very happy today. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Booze rang out at Fratton Park at full time uh, on Tuesday evening. That's eight goals conceded in Portsmouth's last two games. Now, obviously, they lost 4-1 to Rotherham uh, back on the weekend. Uh, George, just how concerned are you for Portsmouth and and in particular Danny Cowley right now? Yeah, um, very concerned. You look at the players he's got at his disposal, um, Marquis, Harness, Curtis. Um, I'm not sure the system he plays at the moment suits him, the the 3-4-1-2, I think. Um, you know, Curtis obviously playing as a bit of a striker and Harness in the 10. I think probably they're two of the best wingers in the division. So I'm not sure why they're playing um, in them roles. I think when you've got a player like Marcus as well, who obviously is a target man, you've got to put the balls in the box to him, but he's not getting the service at the moment. Um, obviously, only win, uh, only one win since the middle of August, and that was the Sunderland game. Um, and that does seem to be a bit of a fluke now. And that's the only clean sheet they kept. I mean, they started the season so solid as well. I think they kept four clean sheets in the first four games. So at the minute, eight goals in the last two games, it's, it's not looking good. Um, and, you know, we we're touching it in the moment, but you look at managers like um, Nigel Atkins who are losing their jobs after a, a slow start to the season. Um, obviously, finishing the playoffs or just outside the playoffs, sorry, at the end of last season. Um, you know, Portsmouth ambitions won't have changed too much from the end of last season, and they'll be hoping to still finish in the top six with the players have got. Um, but at the moment, confidence seems very, very low, um, and it's it's hard to see where to turn it around. Um, we we'll have to wait and see. Yeah, we saw a rare mistake from Pompey goalkeeper Gavin Bazunu on Tuesday. Now he's been in, he's been great form really for for the large part of this season. The uh, young uh, Irish youngster from uh, Manchester City, his error led to uh, one of the Ipswich Town goals, which was which was a shame for for Bazunu because he has been really really impressive in his early stages. Uh, lots of Portsmouth fans after the game kind of criticising the free at the back system in particular. Uh, given that two of them centre-backs are not necessarily natural centre-backs. Obviously, Sean Williams, we've seen operate mainly as a central midfielder and also Kieran Freeman more often plays at full-back. Uh, do you think that's a, an area of concern, Chris, that that kind of, you know, that two of them three centre-backs aren't necessarily natural centre-backs? Yeah, I think um, even if you have natural centre-backs, employing a three at the back is, is tough and it needs a lot of work on the training ground. Um, you know, not not just your positioning when you're out of possession, but also your positioning when you're in possession and, and making those angles for when you want to play out short from the back. You know, if you're not getting those angles right, if a team's pressing you high, then you're going to put yourself under immediate pressure. And um, I think we saw that at, at times last night against uh, against Ipswich. So, yeah, it's a bit, bit of a weird risk to, to take to, to put two players that, you know, aren't natural in that position and in, in that system Um and maybe Cowley will, will think twice about doing that next time. Yeah, absolutely. And just and just finally on Ipswich Town, this they'd hope will be the start of uh, a real kind of uh, kickstart in their campaign. Uh, just uh, worth mentioning, Macaulay Bond, his uh, his goal scoring form this season seems to be uh, pivotal to what the Tractor Boys want to do. And also worth noting, Connor Chaplin. It sounds like he's cemented his place in that number ten role. Uh, George, just how important do you think them two in particular could be for, for Ipswich this this term? Oh, absolutely, yeah. Um, I'm, I'm surprised that, that, that Barnsley obviously let go of Chaplin in the summer. I think he's a very good player. He can play a number of them uh, roles across the final third and obviously the number 10 as well. Bon has been fantastic this season. And my only worry about, uh, from a perspective, would be QPR potentially recalling him in January. Um, I know QPR, I mean, to be fair, aren't exactly short on, on forwards. Uh, Lyndon dark has been in great form, but... If Charlie Austin and uh, Andre Gray don't exactly pull up any trees and start, you know, finding the net on a more regular basis, then 
you know, it's a decision they're going to have to make. Um, so that'll be my concern. But if you can keep them both fit and keep them both at the club, uh, especially Bond, to the end of the season, then they've got a great chance. I mean, the, the highest scorers in League One with 27 goals and is it 13th, which only suggests that they're going to keep on pushing up the table. It's just more about, um, you know, keeping more clean sheets, cleaning less goals. Yeah, absolutely. Well, that was a, a massive win for Ipswich Town uh, on Tuesday night at Portsmouth. Right, let's touch on another League One game next. Um, we saw Lincoln City take on AFC Wimbledon on Tuesday night. It was the Dons that came away with a 1-0 win. Aaron Presley scoring after five minutes uh, a penalty. Uh, Chris, you were there as a supporter. You must be delighted with that one. Absolutely. Um, brilliant first half performance. Probably the best first half performance I've seen all season. Um, apologies for the background noise, by the way. Someone's doing the hoovering. <laughs> rather uh, rather <laughs> annoying, but yeah. Um, no, really good first half performance. Um, the way we pressed them was superb. Um, I think we identified that they like to play out from the back. And mm. in, on some occasions this season, we've had teams that have changed their style um, from not playing out from the back and trying to go more direct because we, we press so high. But Lincoln, um, you know, probably by mistake, didn't, didn't, didn't choose to do that. And they played out from the back and, and it gave us several opportunities to actually increase our lead probably should have been two, three up by half time. And then second half, it was just um, really good defensive performance um, and obviously just keeping the ball and keeping possession of the ball and just seeing out that win. And, and it's it's really good to just get a clean sheet, to be honest, because that's one thing we've been missing this season is keeping clean sheets. And, and keeping a clean sheet at a place like Lincoln, which is obviously no easy place to go, was, was brilliant. And, you know, as, as we said off air before, we restricted them to, I think it was two, Long range efforts. I don't think they have one effort in our penalty area. So, yeah, no, complete sort of away performance and, and everything you want from a, a tough Tuesday night fixture. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's been a, a tough time of it really for Wimbledon in recent weeks in terms of their their results. Uh, that this is their first win uh, in quite a while, but uh, it was some performance. I mean, in in terms of them Wimbledon players, was there any that stood out? I mean, just from me watching the highlights, it looks like Jack Rud Jack Rudoni. Had a lot of pleasure down that right-hand flank. It looks like he created a few chances uh, during the evening. Yeah, absolutely. Um, he's sort of found his position now. Uh, when he when he first came through the academy, we sort of played him in various central midfield roles, and he's he's not really got the physique for it just yet. He's still growing. I think he's I think he's still twenty one, um, and now he's he's playing out wide on the right, and he's just got the trickery to to cause all manner of problems. Um, you know, he can go onto his left foot or onto his right foot, you know, it doesn't matter to him. He's he's not afraid to, to express himself when he's on the ball. And, and that's the reason why, you know, you've seen the likes of QPR link with him before. You know, it's no surprise to any of us to see him link with so many big clubs because, you know, we know that he's, he's got the talent and he's obviously got a head coach in Mark Robinson who's worked with him since he was like 11, 12 years old. So he knows exactly what kind of person he is and exactly how to motivate him and get the best out of him. So, yeah, no, he was definitely a standout performer. Uh, and then Henry Lawrence, again, I think was brilliant um, on loan for Chelsea. Uh, also, England youth international. He's been superb and, you know, he, he doesn't look out of place in League One, League One at all. So, yeah, no, some really good performances, but those two definitely stood out for me. Yeah, absolutely. And just briefly on Lincoln, George, uh, they, they find themselves down in 15th position right now. Uh, it's been quite a slow start for Michael Appleton and his side. An inconsistent start, uh, it's fair to say. There were a number of boos at full time at Central Bank by all accounts. Uh, George, do you think the pressure is growing somewhat on, on Appleton at Lincoln? Uh, yeah, in some ways, I think when you when you don't pick up wins, especially at home, the pressure is always going to be there. Um, it sounds daft, but I think uh, Lincoln could have probably done without having a good season last season because obviously the the goal was never to finish in the playoffs. I think they were happy just finishing a, a strong top half finish, but because of just losing out on a, a ninety minutes away from the championship, that's raised the expectations. And obviously, the summer was massive for them because they lost Johnson and Rogers. Um, Eden went to Blackburn. Grant went to uh, Peterborough. Like, there's four of your main players right there. So you've got to replace the lone player straight away. And obviously, the the, the, the lads, um, Grant and Eden, they haven't really replaced them, or no one's really stepped up to replace them so far. Um, it's only Scully who's scored eleven goals in all competition, remarkably. Um, apart from him, it's not really anyone else. So it was always going to be tough for them. Um, and I think you've got to stick with Appleton because I think he's a good manager. Um, and you know, it's always going to take time when you lose that many key players in the summer but I think they'll be all right in the end well there we go uh, right let's touch on one more league one game next 
Uh, Charlton took on Accrington Stanley on Tuesday night in what you felt was a big game for, for Nigel Adkins uh, and his time at Charlton as their manager. Uh, but it was John Coleman's side that came away with a 3-2 win. Uh, and ultimately, it's cost Nigel Atkins his job. Uh, it's been revealed this morning that uh, he's been sacked as the manager of the Addicts. Uh, Chris, let's come to you then briefly. Um, it did feel like this was coming, didn't it? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, the writing's been on the wall for him for a few weeks now. And um, to lose, you know, Tarkington's... Uh, that's a team that once upon a time Charlton would have been expected to beat and then for them to lose you know 3-2 at home it's just not good at all is it and it's obviously cost him his job um, I think it, it didn't help him that they had you know quite a lot of decent players during during the summer uh, you know the likes of George Thompson we had him at Wimbledon really good player um, and then also McGillery as well from Pompey um, and then a few others you know, it just it just hasn't really gone right for him, and um, yeah, it's it's frustrating for Atkins to be honest. Um, but but at the same time, I, I look at him and and no disrespect to him at all, he's he's locked in the game. But you know, in recent seasons and the other clubs he's been at, he hasn't really achieved much. And like, I kind of think it was more of a short term fix rather than a appointment made with the long term in mind. I know Sangal talked about getting shot onto Europe in ten years, but you know that's. That's just unrealistic. It didn't take a genius to tell you that. Um, but yeah, no, not not good for, for Charlton. And yeah, it'd be interesting to see what direction they're going now with the new manager. Yeah, I mean, the Addicts find themselves in 22nd position right now in League One. Uh, four points uh, adrift from safety. Um, I often bring it up, but uh, us at Football League World predicted Charlton to finish in the top two in our pre-season <laughs> prediction tables. Uh, but that's one prediction that... That's not looking too good right now. Uh, George, we'll come to you just just on Accrington. I suppose it's worth talking about them because this they they do this so often, don't they? You know, very often, you know, they have one of the lowest budgets in League One, but they consistently battle and, and, and you know produce some fantastic results against some of the big guns in the league, don't they? Yeah, yeah, they do. Um, they, they, they almost obviously thrive on that underdog mentality. Um, I mean, it was two big wins for them against Ipswich and, and Charlton, probably two of the biggest clubs in the division. Um, only two wins from the last seven. So it's it, two big wins for them. Um, obviously, they've been a bit consistent of late, but they hopefully turn a corner now. Harry Pell um, scored twice over night. He, he's turned into a real nuisance for them in terms of goal-scoring form. Um, you know, quite an unorthodox central midfielder, very, very tall, very, um, looks very gangly running, um, but he's a, he's a very good player. Um, and obviously, they're doing all this for Dion Charles as well. Obviously, he's not really been in the manager's good books this season, but Cole Bishop has stepped up and been a real key player for them. Um, so it's, it's impressive. And I don't know how John Coleman keeps doing it every year. Yeah, certainly a special job he's doing. Uh, it's also worth shouting out Harry Pell's first goal, that free kick, a wonderful free kick into the top right-hand corner. A uh, really, really nice goal there from, from Aki. Uh, Atkinson Stanley now in 10th position in League One. It's been uh, it's been some start uh, for Stanley and they continue to impress. Uh, but where Charlton Athletic go next in terms of their next manager, uh, we will see. Uh, right, let's touch on League Two next. Uh, we're going to touch on one game from League Two because there seemed to be a lot of draws in League Two in particular on Tuesday evening. But this result was one that certainly stood out, certainly in my eyes. Uh, Hartlepool picked up a 3-1 win away at Bradford City. That is Hartlepool's first away win of the season. Some place to get it as well. Brad Bradford tipped by many uh, to be among the automatic promotion picture. But uh, Dave Challoner's side went there and secured that really impressive victory. Uh, Mark Cullen scoring two uh, for Hartley Paul and Jan Songo scoring an own goal at the death to, to secure the win for Hartley Paul. It's been a really impressive start to the season, George, hasn't it, for, for Hartley Paul? Very impressive, yeah. And, and to be fair, I wasn't really expecting it. Um, obviously, I watched a lot of them last season and the two lads who spearheaded them to promotion were Reese Oates and Luke Armstrong, who both scored above 15 goals, but both um, moved to 
uh, Mansfield yeah. and Armstrong went back to Salford and then joined Harrogate. So um, they found a goal scorer in Tyler Bury, but he's obviously been injured of late. So really important for Cullen to get on the on the score sheet, experienced player for this level at Luton and Blackpool. So um, you know a, a good player, and he'll, he'll hope to fill that goal uh, goal scoring burden. But no, Challenge is doing a fantastic job. The home form has been tremendous, and the atmosphere at Victoria Park has been fantastic. So that's carried them. But obviously, what a place to get it at Bradford, and that should do them wonders for the confidence wise, definitely. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, as for as for Bradford, uh, like I've already said, tipped by many to be to be up there. They find themselves in eleventh position right now. One win from their last six games. They're going for a little bit of a wobble right now, aren't they, Chris? Yeah, absolutely. Um, they were unbeaten at home before before last night, uh, Tuesday night, even. So it's obviously a bit of a blow to them. But you know, I, I always find that uh, when you go unbeaten at home, you always get the same quote from players. Oh, we're going to make it a fortress and all this, and then they end up losing one. So maybe they put unnecessary pressure on themselves um, by saying that kind of thing in, in the press. Um, but but yeah, fair play to Hartlepool going there and, and, and beating them on their own patch. Uh, it's just some real like inconsistencies for Bradford at the moment. But I guess they were always going to have that that sort of period in the season where they wouldn't go on a winning run, and, and I guess they'd rather get out of the way now than, than later on when it comes to the business end next year. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, just worth shouting out Mark Cullen's performance uh, in that particular game. Two goals for him. He has scored in every single English division now, uh, the, all, the way, all the way through, which is uh, some impressive uh, feat from him. Uh, but uh, yeah, hats off to Hartlepool. Uh, a great result for them on Tuesday evening. They continue to impress back in the EFL. Right, that concludes this week's episode of the EFL Midweek Review Show. Uh, Chris, George, thanks for joining me this morning. Thanks, everyone, for watching. Uh, We've got the EFL London Roundup Show later on this afternoon at four o'clock with Billy Mully and Marcus Alley. Well worth tuning in for. I'd imagine a lot of the chat will focus on the situation at Charlton Athletic after Nigel Atkins lost his job this morning. But uh, once again, thanks for watching and we'll catch up soon. (laughs) 